we'd love the opportunity to have some local folks come in and talk to you about some of these issues as well as um, broadband issues and how that might be going. Um, so. All right, we're not gonna wait for Sure. Yeah, that's directed to local officials, and we have a new communications Storm director. I'm not in charge of the communications. Storm the state <laughs> Don't you think that's that's probably cle that's clever? Storm the state house. Storm the state house. <laughs> yeah, boy, yeah. Is Brian Chen uh, involved with the no. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, exactly. Don't worry, it's just We're your right. select board people. Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> Um, Karen, why don't we get going? I'm hopeful that uh, Robin will join us shortly. Um, okay. But just as a um, kind of introduction, um, I reached out to Karen a few days ago, maybe it was a week ago. There um, are some specific parts of this bill that uh, I think we're particularly interested in your feedback on. Um, but um, you know, those in particular relate to how our municipalities and towns are um, you know, reacting from a resilience standpoint. And, um, you know, are there things in here that, uh, um, you know, that you can speak to from, your, obviously, from your members' perspective? Um, you know, I think one of the things that we're trying to address here is not only greenhouse gas emission, Reduction, but also issues related to resilience and mm -hmm. how our um, how our towns and um, communities are are dealing with these issues. Right. So, right. Um, but at any rate, I, I appreciate you also being flexible on your time. We got off the floor a little early, earlier than I think we anticipated today. And, and we so, thought you would be on the floor for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's going to be tomorrow. Oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. So thank you um, for for joining us, Karen. Certainly, and thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, uh, about this issue. What I wanted to do was just set the stage for you a little bit. Um, anecdotally, those are two pictures of um, Moortown Village during Irene that my son took, so they're not copyrighted, at least for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns Board, voted to join the Vermont, Cli um, the Vermont Climate Pledge Coalition on June 27th of 2017. And um, I'm sorry, my glasses on, glasses off, right? Um, I had, let's see, and, and that's part of the America's Pledge, that this is a one-pager about America's Pledge from the organization that, um, Mike Bloomberg and others um, put together Moreau, Weinberger, and Vermont were early um, adopters of that pledge. Let's see if I can get back here. Okay. Um, we are also affiliated with the National League of Cities, and our executive director, Maura Carroll, was on the, uh, ex the board of the National League of Cities. Whoops, wrong one. Um, Oh, I lost that one. Oh, this one. Uh, in 2018, and they've adopted a pretty um, substantial resolution on climate uh, change, which I won't uh, read to you entirely because it's several pages. But um, the one piece that seems most relevant to us is that NLC um, urges Congress and the administration to take urgent action to help states and local governments conduct vulnerability assessments, develop and implement long-term mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency action plans, and identify innovative financing opportunities to implement the assessments and plans. So um, really to uh, conduct the vulnerability assessments, develop the mitigation, and um, fund the um, implementation of the mitigation. We'll look at that back. Uh, at our last count, 130 uh, towns and cities have established energy committees, and that's actually off the VCAN website, which is hosted by the um, Vermont Natural Resources Council. Additionally, we have three towns that um, had submitted their energy components of their municipal comprehensive plan to 
uh, the Public Service Department right after Act 174 was passed a few years ago. Um, now you submit those components to your regional commission and there are 44 towns that have done that to date. And then uh, according to the 350 Vermont, in 2018 and 2019, 55 Vermont towns adopted the the 350 Vermont Climate Solutions Resolution at their uh, town meeting. So we understand that the climate crisis is upon us, as, as Paul Costello um, so eloquently described yesterday. And we understand that it won't be solved without significant action at the state, national, and local level, and international. Uh, volunteers, which is what most local officials and citizens are, have nothing like the capacity by themselves to change the cur current trajectory of climate warning, warming. We welcome this proposal to address climate change through the global warming solutions legislation, especially in light of the federal government's failure to act. And I think if you um, go back and look at the um, climate pledge uh, piece, which is just a one-pager, but there's a whole report that you can read or an executive summary, and the executive summary is pretty, it's quite a few pages also, so you might just want to stick with the executive summary. But um, they talk about actions that need to be taken at the national level as well as um, state levels. We do have several suggestions. Um, to assure that the finite resources that we have in Vermont are spent most effectively. We do endorse the prediction that, sus that the sustainable economy of the future will provide new green jobs in Vermont. It's starting to do that, but we are very concerned about the pain that will be felt by some Vermonters, particularly in rural and less affluent areas, as we make the transition from where we are today to um, where we need to be. H688 would establish a climate council of 22 members and attach it to the Agency of Natural Resources and Department of Public Service. Um, if climate change is our highest priority and our most urgent priority, then we really believe that any such program needs to be attached to the governor's office where it can require action from all agencies across the state. Um, we've had experience with um, Tropical Storm Irene where that was the case. You essentially had an Irene czar and Neil Lunderville and then Sue Minter were very effective at getting projects completed because they had the authority and the backing of the governor. And so we believe that's really important. We've also been in situations where um, agencies go back and forth and, and negotiate for who's going to do what. And I think the municipal roads general permit actually is a good example of that in recent years. Um, we suggest that the council representation include um, one member to represent rural communities and one to represent larger communities. Generally, larger communities in Vermont are um, more than 5,000 population. The average size of a municipality in Vermont is 1,200 population. I mean, we're really, really small. So um, I, I just point that out because the language at Section 4 in the bill as introduced is a, is a little bit um, squirrely in the way it describes uh, the municipal representation. Just so for my understanding, does VLCT represent one of those groups or the other? For example, is, is Burlington one of your members? Or well, Yeah, um, so uh, Moreau, Moreau, the mayor, is the um, chair, the president okay. of VLCT okay. this year. We represent all 246 cities and towns. Okay. The incorporated villages, regional commissions, sheriff's offices are affiliate associate members mostly so that they can get our liability insurance. Okay. We do not represent them, and we're quite specific about that. Okay. Okay. But, but to your point about um, representation of large municipalities and, and uh, more commonly sized Vermont, yeah. uh, those are all under the VLCT umbrella? Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Yeah. Just to repeat, the, 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 your definition of, of large is over what? Well, actually, it's not necessarily our definition. It's in the statute in a few okay. places, I but it's more than 5,000 population. The one you cited. Yeah, okay. 5,000. Um, in the bill, the council would be directed to adopt a Vermont Climate Action Plan by July 2021. And we think that that plan needs to include both a timeline for implementation and um, <coughs> here somewhere else, but also recommendations for funding and how we're going to get there. Uh, the bill would establish several subcommittees, including a just transition subcommittee and a rural resiliency and adaptation subcommittee. Yeah. It is important to focus on how implementing climate actions will affect rural areas where transportation costs are higher, communications networks are less robust, and I think the um, professor from UVM mentioned that this morning, that if we had, or when we have, because we're going to have now as a result of your legislation last year, better broadband service around the state, um, you, people won't necessarily need to travel as far if they can telecommute and things like that. Um, fewer people are available to volunteer for vital jobs such as emergency, emergency medical and fire services when c catastrophe strikes, and that's a major issue for us this year, um, has been for several years in rural areas. And economies generally are more fragile in those areas. They're, um, you know, even if you're a ski area town, the, the ski area is the industry. And, and if anything happens to that, which may, and climate change, um, that will affect the entire community. These are also, of course, the same areas that are home to our farms, the producers of our local food, um, and forests that d sequester carbon, and the people who care for them. We think it would be helpful to include language that authorizes municipalities through their local legislative bodies to enact ordinances to address climate resiliency generally and facilitate you reduce use, use of fossil fuels. There is a bill that came over from the Senate last year, S-106, that talks about self-governance um, more generally and sets up a whole program, but we, we think that in instances where you're trying to address a particular issue and where municipalities can sometimes be innovators and leaders more easily than the state can, um, that you putting language in to uh, allow that to happen would be helpful. Is that um, having not spent time on the government, government uh -huh. operations, uh, is, is that necessary or is it simply being explicit that that, that be allowed? So we're Dylan's rural yeah, state. Sure. We, um, uh, he's from Iowa. We don't know why he's in charge of anything, but um, in Vermont. But, um, right. We got to give them the authority. But you have to you have to be specific. And some towns are. We have a spectrum of municipalities across the state, from those who are willing to take risks and sort of go out on a limb, or have um, special authority in their governance charters, to towns that really feel like they cannot afford to. Um, risk being sued uh, unless they have specific, you know, they need the specific authority mm -hmm. to enact a, um, an ordinance or bylaw. Um, we are concerned about the requirement in H688 um, for municipalities to annually file a report with the director of Vermont Emergency Management concerning, quote, municipal emergency preparedness, infrastructure resiliency, and infrastructure investment. I think this is an example of the potential redundancies that might occur if this bill is passed um, as is. Uh, we already need to. Um, get a municipal roads general permit, we need to provide annual reports to the Agency of Natural Resources and soon to the Agency of Transportation because they're moving the program over there. We need to have road erosion inventories and implementation plans by December 31st of this year. Uh, towns need to adopt local hazard mitigation 
plans every five years that are required in order to receive federal funds from the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and pre-disaster mitigation programs. We need to have local emergency preparedness plans already. Um, they need to be updated and readopted annually and submitted to Vermont Emergency Management in order to receive federal preparedness funds. And um, so the hazard mitigation plans look more specifically at um, what are the potential events and what's the um, likelihood of their occurring in your community. And the emergency preparedness um, plans are for um, how's your fire department, your um, emergency medical technicians, the, the people in your town going to respond to an event when it happens. And I'm going to step way out of line here and mention that Lauren used to work for emergency management until the end of December, right? I already testified. <laughs> okay. So she can fill you in on a lot of details of this stuff if you're interested. And then we have um, municipal comprehensive plans, which towns need to adopt. Um, you don't have to have a plan, but if you don't have a municipal comprehensive plan, um, you forfeit uh, consideration in Act 250, essentially, and before the Public Utility Commission. And you also forego any kind of priority for a whole host of grant funding for different um, programs from the state. That municipal plan needs to be updated and readopted and approved every eight years now, and it needs to include an, an energy component. And if you want special consideration before the Public Utility Commission, um, you need to have an enhanced energy plan that's also approved by the Regional Commission. So um, back on the second page, when I talked about enhanced energy plans pursuant to Act 174, that's what those are. The um, proposed Vermont Climate Action Plan on page 13, we think, needs to incorporate existing smart growth strategies, implement mechanisms to fund particularly emergency services, and recommend funding sources or reallocations of funds to um, implement the plan. We also suggest similarly at um, page 19, section K, which talks about nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the existing authority of a state agency or department um, to establish strategies to mitigate climate risk and build resiliency. We think um, that should they should be required to do that in concert with the Climate Action Plan and what I'm going to call the Office of Climate Resiliency at the governor's level. I mean, you, you, it's really not helpful to have agencies going off in different directions um, trying to enact their priorities. And finally, um, we oppose this section providing a cause of action to any person based on the failure to adopt or update rules. Our experience, which is considerable, um, with lawsuits surrounding the Lake Champlain total maximum daily load was that a tremendous amount of money was spent on lawyers and lawsuits that could have been spent better on implementing projects to address the program, the problem. For seven years, while that um, mess, mess <laughs> was adjudicated, <laughs> Did she use it up there? <laughs> local officials and state officials sat around and waited to, for what was going to be the final word, what was going to be required of them. And where we could have spent, um, we could have been implementing cleanup projects, people were not doing that. They were not interested in spending a considerable amount of money without knowing that that was going to be the appropriate direction to take. And we're very concerned that the same kind of thing would happen here if you had um, a, a cause of action. Um, we think there are other triggers that the legislature con could consider. Uh, I was uh, interested this morning to hear um, UVM professor whose name I forget. I'm John sorry. Erickson. 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 John Erickson. John Erickson. Okay. Um, talk about binding uh, provisions in, and um, 
we have support just as a for instance we've supported a gas tax in the past if revenues were dedicated to local transportation networks and priorities um, that's a tax that could be implemented if deadlines were not met you could have that kind of a trigger um, the administration could be required to return with draft rules to legislative committees of jurisdiction by a date certain before they're implemented or if they uh, which would force them to come back and say why they're not doing what they're required to do um, this is something that was done as part of the Vermont Clean Waters Act so um, those are just two ideas but we do think there are other triggers that could uh, hold Vermont's feet to the fire um, that would be more effective <coughs> and um, more careful of our scarce resources than a cause of action, citizen suits. Question? So going back up to the um, annual, annual reporting. Yes. And I hear, see, and understand um, the objection. So here it is what we're trying to get after in mm -hmm. that, um, and that is in addition to having this vulnerability um, index that you know, the right. government is making an assessment mm -hmm. about you know, our communities and which ones are in the biggest trouble, need the most help, um, there need, it seems like there needs to be some mechanism for communities to also maybe right. be reflecting something back on that. So do you think that the hazard mitigation plans themselves, I, I mean, I'm understanding those can be hard and not all um, there, well, most communities are doing them, but uh, what, what we would say about this whole section is that if you're going to require that kind of vulnerability assessment, then look at what's already required. Right. Tell, have the council or the officer, whoever, look at what's already required and ways to incorporate that into the new requirement so that you're not just layering on another report that um, volunteers need to complete. We, we just completed our um, hazard mitigation plan in my town. I'm on our planning commission. And it took about a year. I mean, it's not supposed to take about a year, but it took about a year because we're all volunteers. And um, it's pretty involved. And uh, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's for FEMA is a labor-intensive job. So we would just ask you to be cognizant of other things that are required and how to, um, you know, mesh all those requirements so that it's not totally unfeasible for local officials. And I think even in some of my towns, they'd probably have to reach out for help from the uh, local MDDA or, you know. Oh, yeah. We had so help. Yeah. We had help. <laughs> <laughs> from the regional commission, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I can, please, too. Please. Um, can you, you skipped over it uh, briefly, but the, the issues around the municipal roads permits and, and why that was difficult? Well, the, um, so the municipal roads permit is something that was required for the first time in the Vermont Clean Water Act. And every town has um, to, to uh, obtain a municipal roads, not really obtain, but they have to have a municipal roads permit um, from the, uh, right now, the Agency of Natural Resources. And it's roads, so the Agency of Transportation is really sort of the expert on roads, but the Agency of Natural Resources is the expert on water quality, those kinds of things. So they've kind of gone back and forth for a while about what exactly is required of municipalities. Um, you need to uh, assess your vulnerabilities in your road network. You need to come up with mechanisms to uh, repair your, not repair your roads, but address those vulnerabilities. So you, if you have steep roads, um, it, stone lining ditches is recommended. We have a lot of road commissioners who think stone lining ditches is um, not a good solution. 
I don't want to get I'd off like on to just, some lining dishes. I'd like to just note for the record <laughs> that I did a full day of ditch school in Wardsboro for Good. Good. With Good. one of our congratulations. Friends. A full day of ditch school. I know more about ditches. <laughs> yeah. Than ever yeah, ditches um, and There's culverts right. and bottomless culverts oh. and when they turn into bridges and all those kinds of things, it, it's very expensive to make those investments. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of remains to be seen how successful they will be at um, addressing runoff, basically, in that instance, stormwater runoff in storm events. Well, again, if I can elaborate too, your point there is that these agencies really need to be in collaboration right up front. Um, whether it's yeah, agency, they, yeah. And, they do. and it's the same with the ag agency and, and ANR. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I just heard a horror story up my way with somebody who did some cutting and got the proper permits and everything. Next thing you know, found out that it was supposedly in the wetlands. Right. So it's a cease and desist order, and I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. And I, and, you yeah. Know, so that it's so important that you know all the agencies, whether it's it's one uh, agency or whatever that that has the collective information to issue the permits or whatever, it's it's critical. I think. Our our experience at the local level is that, um, and we don't need to get too much into this either, but um, particularly at the agency of natural resources. People who are administer their program and they're very good at their program, and they don't. There's not really anybody at the Nat agency of natural resources that's taking the whole view of everything that you need to um, do, and which takes priority. We end up with permits that have conflicting requirements. Um, stormwater and wetlands was a good example. Um, so that's a real problem and we really don't want to end up in that kind of a situation uh, with this legislation. I had a question going back to your uh, what you said earlier on about uh, your, your thinking that this should be uh, coming directed out of the governor's office rather than right. a particular agency. When when that happened in the past, um, that was for a pretty time-limited mm -hmm. single event. I mean, it was a right. statewide event, but, it, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it, so what is your thinking in terms of, I see that as a difference between yeah. what we're looking at uh, being something uh, that would be a, a, a more ongoing Mm -hmm. uh, piece of work. I don't know for you know for how long, but but it's not right. to deal with that with that one catastrophe. Right. So I just wonder what. To well, um, I don't know that that's. I mean, I understand the difference. Uh -huh. I don't know that it makes a lot of difference in this context because if you're, it, it seems to us that if this is the highest priority and everything needs to feed into how are we going to address this particular problem, that the people who are directing that effort need to be at the highest level of government. And, and another example that is not a good example, I will say, is we used to have a state planning office out of the governor's office. And there was a governor who came along and decided that wasn't worth his while. But, um, but I think it... Uh, you know, there was that office for a period of time. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing. It's just yeah. as a new, as a, you threw out something, a different alternative right. on the table, and I'm just asking because yeah. there, there is that <coughs> sort of time limited uh, assignment that occurred at uh, right. that time versus. Uh, but you're right. The, the planning office was considered uh, an ongoing <coughs> function of the. Right. right. And if you write it into statute, I think they can't, um, you know, say we don't want to do this anymore. Well, uh, but if it, if it is a, a governor's office function, mm -hmm. then it would seem to depend a lot on who the governor is. It's not, it's not, it's not sort of, uh, it's not sort of built into the, to the sort of ongoing um, I don't know, bureaucracy is such a 
operations. negative negative loaded word operations all right of, of, of state government um, as it would be if it were uh, sort of career career um, agency people working on it right um, you, I mean it would depend kind of how you structured it um, as to as to how I mean you'd have to talk about how to structure it I know that it's been recommended it that there's like an uh, climate change czar or something, which is along the same lines. Um, and uh, governors do change. I, I think that, um, that- This just seems like it would be more exposed yeah. to political, you know, uh, the, 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 I don't know the, the, the politics of the person in the office yeah. rather than, rather than um, a sort of institutionalized operation of state government. I, I, I don't know that there, I mean, we could talk about that, right. but it seems that in some ways that it doesn't make a lot of difference because commissioners and secretaries are appointed by whoever the governor is and they carry out um, that person's agenda, so it, at the agency's level. But um, what we really do want to avoid is a situation where agriculture, transportation, public service, natural resources are all sort of jockeying for what they want to have happen, and in the meantime, not a lot happens. So I have the same question, uh, and I'll take advantage of you being here now. We, I'm happy to talk about it more later, too, um, which is really a good governance question, mm -hmm. and you have addressed this head on as, as to what your recommendation is, that there be something much closer to the governor that mm -hmm. deal with this. Um, you know, as I've thought about this bill purely from a good governance perspective, what is an entity that can best get something done? Right. Uh, this exact question is something that I've struggled with, and I don't have strong, strong feelings that it'd be one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, my focus is on accountability, and um, I, these aren't my words, but um, but I've used them, um, which is there's one neck to choke. Uh -huh. Who is accountable for right. this work getting done? Mm -hmm. Not that they do all of it necessarily. Mm -hmm. And one um, viewpoint, I think it's probably one that, that you share, or at least are closer to, is that this should be either somewhere much closer to the governor or even the agency of administration yeah. that sits at the head of the table. Mm -hmm. um, and But they're not necessarily in a, a um, a regulatory body that is, is focused on, you know, they have more of a, a mm -hmm. financial function and are closer to the to the governor kind of in that regard. Um, you know, some of the policy orientation is a little farther removed. Right. Um, uh, but at the same time, it, you know, it has more, a more of a regulatory function. And, you know, ANR, on the other hand, is charged with regulating pollution. Um, so, Again, this is more of a, it's not an ideological question from my standpoint, it's a good governance question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we are going to build this and we're looking for accountability, mm -hmm. um, where does that best reside? Right. Again, I don't feel strongly about it, um, but yeah. I'm just looking for the best answer. Yeah. And I think I'm, I, I certainly hear what you're saying on that. You do have in this bill, you have the council, and the yeah. council has the secretaries of the agency. That's correct. And um, in ANR as the chair of that council. Yeah. So, well, that's an interesting thing. You might want to change that. But anyway, well, I, I mean, like, if you're, you if you're going to, if <laughs> you're going to if you're going to have it in the governor's office, then it should probably be the secretary of administration, right? Well, that's what I was saying. That's, yeah, that's but point. but um, but uh, the so then that council and the secretary of administration, whoever the um, climate change czar, yeah. uh, is the person who says to the Agency of Natural Resources and the Agency of Transportation, you need to adopt regulations that implement this particular component of our overall program. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm missing the point that you're making, but when you talk about a um, this position not being a and R, I was presuming you were talking about that um, a and R not being the, the uh, essentially the chair of the council. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we are in the same. Yes. Okay. Got it.
We're happy to talk to any of you about this more or come Great. back or answer other questions whenever. Great. So thank you and thank, thank you for you. the detailed um, feedback. Is it, do you have a question? Yeah, I do, Karen. Um, I know we're in the, the infancy stages of this bill, but um, is the word getting out in municipalities about the possibility of, of all this coming down? Well, I'm writing about it on Thursday yeah. night for Friday morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we're, hopefully we, we um, are getting through to our members about this. We did have a um, climate conference a couple 2018, I want to say, um, that looked at a number of these issues. I mean, towns, e even, the, even the smallest towns understand that, you know, we have to do something. We have to address these issues. I mean, up in in your in Ludlow, they've had a couple of road collapses and from flooding events. That nobody's exempt from those kinds of um, natural events, and and we're going to have to address them. It's it's a matter of how can we do it effectively, and how can we sort of corral the interest that's already out there and what people want to do and what they actually need to have. Um, not be too messy. Thank you, Karen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, why don't we get started here? Um, Laura will catch up with us shortly, hopefully. Um, okay. So um, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, I think we had originally planned to um, have uh, three folks uh, testify, and um, um, we're having um, a member of your board join us uh, Friday afternoon. So I look forward to that. Um, but we record all of our hearings, so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves for the record, and, um, and welcome to join us. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Phil Huffman. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Policy for the Nature Conservancy here in Vermont. And uh, I know some of you, but not all. And I uh, just want to say I'm really delighted to have an opportunity to engage with all of you on this really important topic. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by a wonderful colleague from our Massachusetts chapter, Laura Marks. Uh, who's a forest ecologist, has been with the Conservancy based in Massachusetts for 14 years, I think. Uh, this is her first time today coming to our office, so it's a moment of uh, a noteworthy moment for us. Uh, anyway, Laura is also the Nature Conservancy's uh, <coughs> regional lead for New England on natural climate solutions, which is basically the role that nature and natural and working lands, the land sector, can play in helping to slow the pace of climate change. So she's a wealth of information, and I think we're really uh, we're pleased to be able to have her here and, and uh, excited that she can offer some of that broader perspective. Um, she also will have an opportunity to speak a little bit about, um, from her and the, and the Nature Conservancy's perspective in Massachusetts about their experience with their Global Warming Solutions Act, so we'll dig into all of that in a little bit. Um, and she's based in Western Massachusetts, um, in the, out of the, an office in the Northampton area. Um, so maybe a trip north for us today. Uh, I know you uh, had the opportunity to hear from another voice, a brand new voice for us at the Nature Conservancy last week, uh, our wonderful new colleague, Lauren Oates, uh, who testified um, about the resilience side of things uh, and from some of her perspective from her earlier work with the um, Vermont Emergency Management Agency. Um, so now we're sort of, we'll be shifting today and focusing more on the, the uh, part of this around nature's role in helping to, to rein in climate change and sort of a, a complement on the other side from resilience and adaptation. Uh, and uh, what, what, a, what we're thinking, and I just, if this is, works for you all, is that I'll spend just a minute, um, since this is our first time really before uh, your committee, to uh, just give you a little bit more of an overview about the Nature Conservancy to uh, help round out the picture that you may or may not uh, have of us. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Laura to really go into some of the uh, big picture and, and uh, uh, key points related to natural climate solutions uh, and to share some of that experience from Massachusetts with their uh, parallel uh, efforts uh, down there. And then I'll come back in uh, and uh, 
share a little bit about our perspective here in Vermont um, about all of this work and how it ties into a number of other policy initiatives that are underway, some of which I think you're familiar with, but others of which you may not, and work that's happening on our part and others that are relevant to all of this, and really how it all ties into the Global Women's Solutions Act. And I'll share, I'll sort of close with our perspective on the bill itself. Um, does that sound like a yep. workable flow? And we'll try to keep things moving. Appreciate this is getting towards the end of a long day in a small room uh, with not a lot of airflow. So we'll, we'll try to keep it moving. You noticed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can already feel it. Uh, you know. uh, so just by way of uh, rounding out a little bit of what Lauren said in her testimony last week about the Nature Conservancy, um, as you may or may not know, we're a global conservation organization. <laughs> Uh, dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all life depends, so that's human life, as well as all the other species of plants and animals and everything else that we share this planet with. Uh, one of our hallmarks everywhere we work, here in Vermont and elsewhere, is that we're science-based, so we try to gather the best science that we can, either science that we develop or that we gather from others to inform our own conservation work and to also help to inform the work of other conservation nonprofits, governmental agencies at the local, state, federal, and global level, uh, that sort of thing. So science is, is a really uh, critical hallmark of ours. Guided by that science, we really work on trying to create innovative, on-the-ground solutions to some of the biggest challenges facing people and nature and the planet. Uh, certainly climate change is at the top of the list, but it's by no means the only one. Habitat loss, uh, things like that, or you know, water quality issues. Uh, those are examples of other big problems that we're working hard to uh, help to address. We are uh, devoutly nonpartisan. Um, we have a long track record of working with folks from across uh, political and ide the political and ideological spectrum on pragmatic solutions. So we really are trying to focus on getting things done and finding ways to uh, bridge different perspectives to get there. Uh, we work in all 50 states across the U.S. Uh, and more than 70 countries around the world now. Uh, and here in Vermont, happy to say, we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year, actually, uh, now that it's 2020. Uh, so we've been at it for a while. And over the course of that time, we're really proud to say that we've been involved in helping to conserve <coughs> more than 300,000 acres of land, permanently conserved, more than 300,000 acres of both natural and working lands uh, around the state in all different corners, I think, in most, if not all, of your districts. Uh, and about more than 1,200 miles of shorelines of our streams, rivers, and uh, ponds and lakes. Uh, so some of our really key natural heritage, natural assets, um, we've had an important hand in helping to protect. We have more than 9,000 members statewide now. We actually are the biggest per capita membership of any TNC chapter in the country, we're, we're proud to say. And just I think that's a reflection of the way in which Vermonters care about this work. Um, that, uh, it's so relevant uh, to all aspects of our, of our lives. Uh, and we also, as part of our uh, conservation we work, we own and manage um, 55, 56 <coughs> natural areas uh, scattered all across the state, again, in uh, most, if not all, of your districts. So that's just a quick snapshot. I hope that helps to, to round out the picture a little bit of who we are and what we do. Um, and happy to dig in more on that uh, later, if you'd like. So with that, why don't I hand it over to Laura, um, and she can uh, dig in more on some of the uh, content specifics on natural climate solutions. Great. Thanks, Phil. And thank you to Committee Chair Briglin as well for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as Phil mentioned, my name is Laura Marks, and I'm the forest ecologist for the Nature Conservancy in Massachusetts. Um, my goal today is to share some of my the boring outline that's going to go away soon, I promise. <laughs> but I want to share some of um, TNC's experiences with Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act and to focus in particular on the role of natural climate solutions in climate action. So we know that climate change is already an economic, environmental, and humanitarian crisis. And that's the reason for that is not unknown, right? We've got fossil fuels making the earth too hot. But fortunately, we also know what to do about it. That's also not an unknown. First of all, we need to stop burning so many fossil fuels. But that alone isn't enough. So we also need to cool the earth. <laughs> and that's where natural climate solutions come in. They're like these ice cubes, actually absorbing carbon that has been emitted in the air and absorbing heat from the planet. And then I would be remiss in ignoring the fact that climate change is already here. So we also have to. 
like adapt to climate change. <laughs> so these three things have to happen simultaneously to take action to actually address a problem at the scale of climate change. And I and the rest of my TNC colleagues feel very fortunate to live in a state that is working really hard to reduce carbon emissions and adapt to climate change through our Global Warming Solutions Act. And I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my experiences and thoughts with you as you contemplate your own GWSA. As you consider the best way for Vermont to continue to lead on climate change action, I'd urge you to set bold goals for fossil fuel emissions reductions and also to include a role for natural climate solutions, Vermont's forests, farms, and wetlands as well. Natural climate solutions are ways to protect, restore, and better manage forests, farms, and wetlands to avoid and or remove carbon emissions from the air. For example, avoided forest conversion is one natural climate solution. When we convert an acre of forest or another land use to development, we release a portion of the carbon that's stored in the soils and trees uh, over decades or centuries as carbon emissions. And at the same time, we destroy the ability of that piece of land to sequester more carbon over future years. So avoided forest conversion, which is often a fancy way of saying land protection of forests, is a double win for carbon. And that's before we even begin to talk about the benefit of forests for our forest products economy, recreation economy, for wildlife, for water filtration, all those things that we depend on them for. Another natural climate solution that's relevant in Vermont is improved forest management. And this means a number of things. In some places, that means setting aside forests as reserves to store carbon in larger and older trees. In most places, that means doing careful timber harvesting that considers carbon and also that produces wood <coughs> products that we can substitute for more carbon intensive products like steel, concrete, uh, heating oil, or just the same wood products from farther away. Using sustainably harvested New England wood reduces emissions by substituting a more sustainable resource for a more fossil fuel intensive. One. So not, again, there's sort of a double benefit. A third way of using forests as a natural climate solution is to retain and perhaps even plant more trees. In Massachusetts, we're a very urban state, so tree planting is a surprisingly large strategy. We have hundreds of thousands of acres of suburban lawn in our state. In Vermont, it's a little bit different. And I suspect that you'll probably be more focused on tree retention because even though we take our street trees or the ones in our yards or parks for granted, when you have something like the tornado that hit Springfield, Massachusetts, or an insect outbreak that takes out huge amounts of these trees, you'll actually feel that literally in the heat in the summer and also in your energy bills and energy use in the buildings that were formerly shaded and sheltered by trees. So by now, you might be noticing a theme where natural climate solutions have a carbon benefit, but they also have a lot of other co-benefits, human health, like trees and cities, uh, economic benefits, like forestry. Um, and so in many cases, the reason to do these natural climate solutions may be not only or even primarily carbon, but that's one of their benefits. And I've been focusing on forests here because Vermont, like Massachusetts, is a mostly forested state, but it would be wrong to ignore the impact of farms and wetlands as well. So forests get most of the attention, but I know that the Vermont Agency of Agriculture and partners in the farming community are already really thinking hard about how to make some of the farming practices that have carbon and other co-benefits more feasible and cost-effective. Um, I was really excited to learn yesterday that your Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group has released a report on this. That actually puts, thank you, that puts you ahead of um, Massachusetts where we're just now working on our Healthy Soils Action Plan. And um, that considers, among other things, ways to increase soil carbon on farms. In Vermont, adoption of cover cropping, silvopasture or trees on farmlands, and fertilizer management can help make the soil more carbon rich while also reducing nutrient runoff and erosion. And in the case of silvopasture, it can even increase milk production. So again, carbon might not be the primary reason that you wanna do these things, but you are getting a carbon benefit as well. And it's worth um, 
uh, thinking about that and, and recording that as well, because we do have significant per, uh, potential to reduce carbon emissions and increase sequestration by increasing the health of our farm soils. And then finally, wetlands. If farms are overlooked, wetlands are even more overlooked. Uh, wetlands store an outsized amount of carbon for their size. They're a very small fraction of the landscape but they can store, in some cases, um, many decades worth of carbon. And wetlands can also be either carbon sinks, if they're healthy and intact, or they can be carbon sources if they're degraded and especially if they're drained. So it's really worth thinking about the health of your wetlands, thinking about restoration of wetlands, again, for a range of reasons, including wildlife habitat and flood prevention, but also so that they continue to play that role of sequestering carbon in soils year after year. So we have some very good estimates already of the potential of natural climate solutions in Vermont. And although there are differences in which, in our two states, in which natural climate solutions work best, for example, city tree planting is a big strategy in Massachusetts, while improved forest management is a bigger opportunity in Vermont, taking full advantage of climate solutions like those I mentioned can avoid or reduce more than a million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent each year at low cost. That's the equivalent of taking more than 200,000 cars off the road every year. And right now, the only technology we have that can reduce, that can remove carbon emissions at scale is nature. So hopefully that's a little bit of information about natural climate solutions and the potential in Vermont. I wanted to move on to sharing some lessons learned from our experience in Massachusetts that might be useful. So from the perspective of TNC's Massachusetts chapter, we're pleased with the greenhouse gas emissions reduction and the smart policies and the change in the narrative around climate change that have come from our Global Warming Solutions Act. It's absolutely been worth it. And we're mostly on track to meet our 2020 goal. So these figures are as of 2016, and Massachusetts has reduced emissions by 21% below 1990 levels. There's a study happening right now that will figure out whether we're projected to meet our 25% goal, but they're actually running the numbers this year, and so we'll know by the end of the year whether or not we met that initial 2020 goal. I think some of the biggest successes from the Global Warming Solutions Act have been around public-private partnerships. And this is one where I actually had some personal experience. So many years ago, I was eligible to enter a lottery for weatherization of my 1910s era, very drafty, poorly insulated house. And that was a state-run energy efficiency program. But the only reason I knew about it was because there was a local nonprofit that was advertising, there was a local company that was doing the work. And so programs like that are really effective. I got insulation for my house, which is a real benefit to me. Meanwhile, the state got me using much more, much less energy every year. So they got very inexpensive um, emissions reductions. And again, if the state had done it on their own, I think it might have been hard for the average person to figure out, you know, where do you go for information? How do you find out? But by working across that public-private partnership, they were able to get a program that was wildly oversubscribed and successful. Another su success, I think, was that we've really aimed big. So um, right now, where Massachusetts is in the process, our law actually set emissions reductions goals for 2020 and 2050. It didn't set them for 2030 and 2040. It left that up to another process. And we are in that process for 2030. There's a study right now that I think you'll probably hear more about from David Ismay and Han Chu um, called the 80 by 50 study. It's essentially how do we get to 80% emissions reductions by 2050? And what? And given that path, what's the right goal to set for 2030? Uh, and what policies do we need to get there? Um, with more than 10 years of putting the Global Warming Solutions Act into practice, we're actually thinking potentially beyond that, you know, looking at can we get to more than 80% emissions reductions. Um, I was really pleased to see that net zero is referenced in your Global Warming Solutions Act. And just uh, last night, Governor Charlie Baker actually endorsed the idea of moving to net zero in Massachusetts. So maybe he read your bill and got jealous, but um, that, just, that just came out. 
Um, and then finally, I think another big su success was really including adaptation in the bill. We have an executive order, EO 569, that ensures that any action taken under the Global Warming Solutions Act can't be sort of maladaptive, especially for underserved communities. So it's a recognition that the impacts of climate change are already being felt, and they're being felt most immediately and most acutely by our communities that have perhaps the fewest resources. And there's also an adaptation plan that's part of the Global Warming Solutions Act. So there were a lot of efforts to really make sure that uh, climate change mitigation, emissions reduction, and adaptation went hand in hand. So what's interesting is that I think we did adaptation really well, and that certainly has a role for nature-based solutions, using nature to solve problems like flooding and um, stormwater management. But um, despite that integration, I think one of the places we have the most distance to go is in fully incorporating the role of natural climate solutions in our Global Warming Solutions Act. And that's probably my biggest lesson learned to offer you from the experience in Massachusetts. After you pass your Global Warming Solutions Act, which has all the language you need, as your climate council begins to implement it, I would encourage you to think about lands as a sector. Lands are both a carbon source with actions that can, can be taken to reduce emissions, and they're a carbon sink with actions that can be taken to sequester even more carbon. I think in, in Massachusetts, carbon is in our baseline. Natural carbon is in our 1990 baseline. But from every point then on, it's treated very differently from all the other sectors. And I think that had we integrated those more from the beginning, we could have saved ourselves some headaches. For example, now in the 80 by 50 study, it's very hard um, to sort of fully bring in lands when we need them to meet our emissions reduction goals. And I think we could have saved ourselves also some controversies over solar siting and other aspects where, because the intersections between buildings and lands and energy weren't fully considered, um, there, were, there were some policies that, that people feel maybe were counterproductive to one or the other sector. So to sum up, um, you know, nature has a role to play. The biggest action we need to take is reducing fossil fuels, but natural climate solutions are a meaningful and necessary part of acting on climate change. And if you don't believe me and Phil saying that, you can read the IPCC report or the drawdown report, like every plausible path globally and at the US level to meeting, to really addressing climate change includes going backwards in emissions. Um, and that's what I have as number three here. There's also some really simple math. 415 parts per million carbon dioxide is about what we're at now. I looked, I think it's 417 now. It keeps going up, of course, but 415-ish plus zero doesn't get you to 350. You really need both to reduce emissions and to go backwards. Um, you know, another reason is because it's easier, I think, to do it now than later. You can work things in from the beginning as you decide how to implement your law and maybe save yourself some of the headaches that we've had. And also, you said you would, so did Massachusetts. So all of the US Climate Alliance states pledged to each other in 2018 that they would accurately measure the carbon balance in their natural working lands. They would set a numeric goal for making that number better, and then they would implement the plans to make that happen. And Phil and I went both to the US-wide uh, learning lab, they called it, that the US Climate Alliance held in DC in 2018. And we just came back from the regional New England one in Rhode Island last month, and those pledges are coming due at the end of 2020. So as a collective across the US Climate Alliance, um, those states have sort of pledged to each other to, to move forward on this. And um, then finally, Vermont has an opportunity to be a leader on the US and the global stage. And when I was saying that, I was like, ah, oh, people are gonna be like, really? It sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. And I'll give you a clear example of why it's not. So some of our TNC colleagues yesterday in Bogor, Indonesia, held a workshop where they are trying to figure out this very thing. How do they work natural climate solutions into their nationally defined contribution under the Paris Agreement? And in the complete absence of federal leadership, countries are really looking to the US states as the actors, not to the federal government. So whereas in the past, maybe that would have been a little bit of an exaggeration, there is no federal leadership that they're looking at and taking their cues from. They're looking at what Massachusetts is doing, at what Maine just did, at what you guys are contemplating doing, at New York, at California, at Maryland, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and trying to look for examples of 
states, which are much more analogous to them than the US right now, um, and take their cues from that. So I think it's really exciting that you guys are contemplating passing the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and hopefully this has helped just a little bit in thinking about the role nature might play as you implement that. Um, I'm gonna hand things back over to Phil, but then we're, we're happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And, and I think we can pause before I resume if you want, if any of you have questions for Laura at this point. Um, just I, to I have plenty. Break, yeah. break the flow. Yeah. Or, but, so <laughs> I don't know, however you'd like to handle it is fine with us. I think why, is what why don't I we need to say. go ahead and, and you know bring your presentation to a conclusion and then we'll jump in. That's okay. With you. That's, sure. uh, sounds great. Whatever works best for you all. Okay. Terrific. All right. Well, thanks. Um, and I think just have one more slide that I'll use just as the backdrop with a few key points that I want to hit on uh, to round out our our presentation. Um, first, just a few kind of big picture sort of overarching messages about natural climate solutions building on what Laura has said. I think it's really important to emphasize that um, as much as we see the opportunity for, uh, that natural climate solutions offer as part of tackling climate change and feel it's absolutely imperative to try to take advantage of that opportunity uh, and it's woven into uh, into H688 right now, um, we recognize it's not a silver bullet, right? This is not going to solve the problem, as Laura said. We've got to turn off the, you know, turn off the uh, the gas that's uh, heating up the planet while we also are doing things that are working to cool it down. It has to be a both and, uh, and that uh, as much as nature can help us, it's uh, it's not the solution. So it's not a silver bullet. But I I heard someone use this expression the other day, and I couldn't can't remember who it was. But we see it as a really essential part of the silver buckshot uh, that we need to be thinking about collectively to tackle climate change. So it needs to be a lot of different things. I know I'm not telling you anything with that that you don't already uh, appreciate. But um, and and just building on that, um, this you know it's really not a replacement for the deep cuts in carbon emissions uh, and moving to a clean energy future as quickly as we possibly can uh, that is so imperative. Um, that said, <clears throat> natural climate solutions we see are a really key cost-effective tool for taking carbon out of the air and that can help us get uh, from our current goals to net zero or beyond actually uh, to net negative uh, over time. Uh, and in doing that, we can uh, secure a whole bunch of other benefits um, for our communities, for our economy, uh, and for our environment um, that complement those needed re emissions reductions and turning down the heat, essentially. Uh, and just to, to reiterate and, and sort of fill in uh, a little bit more um, around those co-benefits, uh, we really see it that by investing in conservation and restoration and sound stewardship of our natural and working lands, so in our land sector generally, we can capitalize on their potential to help slow climate change while we gain all these other benefits. And so things like jobs and economic development, water quality improvements, reduced vulnerability to flooding, places for outdoor recreation and all of the benefits that go along with that, health and well-being uh, for being able to access the outdoors uh, and feed our souls, uh, quality of life uh, and the way that all of these things tie into the attractiveness of Vermont for people to live here, whether those of us who are already here or people who may be interested in coming, um, and for more of the sort of natural benefits around wildlife, uh, biodiversity, made this, uh, sustaining our native plants and animals. Uh, so we see there's an opportunity really for sort of a virtuous circle uh, in all of this. Um, and whether you're coming at it from a carbon perspective or from a water quality perspective or some of those other perspectives, there's a way to be getting synergies from all of these uh, that can be mutually reinforcing and addressing a number of big challenges that we have here in Vermont through the same sorts of actions of conservation, restoration, and sound stewardship of our lands. Uh, I wanted to spend just a minute, uh, again, building on what Laura said, but tying all of this and uh, how it shows up in the Global Warming Solutions Act before you uh, with other ongoing policy work here in Vermont and, and efforts that are underway. Uh, 
beyond the policy realm. I, I think I'll start with one that Laura was just touching on, which is the, this um, reference to what the state committed to doing as part of its uh, signing in to the U.S. Climate Alliance a couple of years ago. And there is one of the main streams of that effort on, on the part of the 25 states across the country that are part of the U.S. Climate Alliance relates to trying to uh, better quantify and then also increase um, the uh, absorption of carbon and storage of carbon in the land sector, natural and working land sector. It's something where um, we've been uh, trying to uh, work with and encourage the state to, to get more deeply involved in. I think there's a, an openness to doing that. We haven't seen a lot of action yet, um, but I'm hoping that over the course of this year, we'll see more forward progress. And I think the timing of it woven in with uh, this bill and other climate initiatives that are happening here in the legislature are hopefully will go hand in hand. Uh, and this is another part of that sort of silver buckshot. Uh, other ones, uh, Representative Higley can speak to this uh, in more depth than I can, um, but uh, is the four efforts that have been initiated by you all uh, in the last session related to forest carbon sequestration and looking for opportunities to make it uh, easier for Vermont landowners, private landowners, but also municipal and potentially the state to access existing carbon markets, uh, offset markets. Uh, so I know Commissioner Snyder spoke with you all about that maybe 10 days or two weeks ago. We won't go deep on it now. Um, one of our colleagues, Jim Shallow, our conservation director here in Vermont, was part of that working group. Happy to have him come back and share more both on that and on some ongoing work that we're a part of um, with trying to, to develop some innovative new uh, pilot projects or test proving grounds. Um, of efforts to access carbon markets um, for Vermont landowners here. Uh, and we've been doing that on our own lands um, up in Representative Higley's backyard at our Burnt Mountain uh, parcel um, up in Montgomery and a little bit in Eden and Lowell. Uh, and then also we're in a collaboration with the Vermont Land Trust, um, again in that same neck of the woods with private landowners, uh, trying to figure out how to bundle a number of different private land holdings together into a package that's big enough to access, it has sort of the economy of scale to access existing voluntary carbon markets. Um, and then we also are part, and Laura's involved in this as well, with a, a really fledgling effort, that, but that we're very hopeful um, about with the American Forest Foundation uh, that's called Family Forest Carbon. Um, it's a program that's been piloted actually down in the central Appalachians, um, but that we're trying to bring into Vermont and Massachusetts, um, which would be helping to access revenue streams for landowners to do essentially carbon-friendly forests, uh, forestry, excuse me, um, not in a way to try to access offset markets, but just to uh, provide some revenues for them uh, for doing different improved forest management carbon-friendly practices. Uh, and that's something it, it, that we're really hopeful about. It's like, we'll, you know, we'll see. Um, but uh, it could be a great tool for accessing particularly smaller parcels um, and uh, providing some new revenues that can uh, really reward landowners for good forest stewardship, which is what we all want to see, I think, um, and the landowners themselves are deeply committed to helping them keep their lands as forests, and so that where we're helping to sustain that carbon sink and not getting into a situation where they're having to sell their lands and convert it and risking the carbon source that that can result in. And, and where would those revenues come from? Well, so, I don't know, Laura, do you want to help well, out? Or for the pilot, they'll come from a grant. So we have a grant, um, as you so often do when you do the first ones, you kind of have money lined up. Um, and it's Western and Central Massachusetts as well. Southern Vermont is the pilot area where we're trying to port what they did in the Central Appalachians and move it up. After that, it gets a little more complicated. Massachusetts has a state policy program that seems like it might um, be a, it's, it's a, version of our current use program, I think you guys call it current use appraisal, and we call it chapter, yeah, and we call it chapter 61, so it's kind of an add-on to that. Um, the, after that, there is a lot of discussion about the desire for more and more companies and private actors to basically pay for climate outcomes. Offsets, there's a certain market for that. There's also people who want to incent good behavior, help it easier, help make it easier for people who already want to do a behavior, but maybe it costs them a lot of money to sort of do cost share. Kind of like NRCS, where, so Natural Resource Conservation Service is okay. a federal agency that, for example, will pay farmers 
you know, here's half the cost of putting fencing up around your stream so that your cows don't go through it. Um, so it's not an offset, it's a payment for a practice that they know has benefits. In this case, it's payment for practice we know has carbon benefits. But as Phil mentioned, um, these things are also, I think we're very committed to being open about whether or not it works. You know, we're trying it out. Um, we're trying not to go in with too many assumptions. It's really promising in the central office. It's also being piloted in California. But if at the end of the day we can't make things work in this region, we'll report that back and, you know, look for the next opportunity. It sounds like you, you have to have uh, either either government revenues or, or a foundation to support something like this. Well, the them. model of the central apps is um, more about private companies and, like, supply chains, and there's a whole complicated thing that's over my head about how you set that up. Mm -hmm. um, some of the big tech companies have made enormously large pledges. Now, those are on paper. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they've translated yet. And our carbon here is actually really attractive because we don't have fire the way they do in some other parts of the country. And so when people pay for practices here, they're not quite as concerned that it's going to go up in smoke the next year. So again, there's economists with much different expertise than I am who have like worked all the things out and they show it to me and I'm like, that's great. We're really trying to be like, let's put it in practice on the ground, come up with the practices, see how much they cost, see who signs up and figure out whether the, that sales pitch that they're doing in the central apps, you know, works here. So, yeah, well, it's well, not, not amazing to labor point, But I mean, they're not getting, the, the companies that would be fronting the money for this aren't getting anything. They're not getting carbon credits or anything. They so, are. They, they are, are getting That's climate. what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, so. so there are companies that are going for carbon offsets, where they're like, we want you to figure this out to the nth degree. And that's fine. And that's one set of markets. But there are other actors, including companies, including some of the big forestry companies, including things with big supply chains that are basically saying, we want to make, we want to take climate outcomes. We want to improve our, our supply chain. We want to show we're taking this seriously. We want the goodwill. We want the marketing. I mean, there are all sorts of things that they're getting. But what they aren't getting is, this is your carbon that you're allowed to emit. That's that's sort of the difference. It is also worth noting that we think that one or two of the practices we're developing here probably will work in that offset market. So for that one, the funding might come from offsets, but there will be others where it just doesn't fit the, the market doesn't work very well often for those small private mm -hmm. forest landowners. And that's just a different sort of thing. Again, these are also questions we're asking okay. about how many of these companies and how long is their attention span and how much money and right, right, right. Okay. exactly. Okay. So these are good, good questions for sure. Definitely. And I have a handout about this family forest carbon uh, program, high level <coughs> overview that I'm happy to pass out when we're done. It's also, uh, Danielle has it for the record, um, that may help to answer this a little bit more. And also it, this could be part of a follow on conversation if you have the interest in a time later where we we could get Jim Shallow in to uh, dig deeper on this and on some of the carbon offset work that we are doing on our own and with Vermont Land Trust and, and others um, with the state and things. So, right. I've got one other question on this: or is it similar to flight shaming? Uh, so there's uh, an effort out there from a lot of people, right. whether it's they feel bad that they've taken right. an air flight, or there was even talk in our committee about you know uh, requiring uh, vehicle sales places to have some form of a, a program around that, but right. it's I a feel good thing in um, a sense. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a real, I'd have to think that one through. I mean, I think the pitch to companies would not be so much like you're doing bad stuff and so you should do this, but more here are these small landowners who know what to do and want to do it and the numbers just don't work for them. And you have the opportunity to show that you're helping that and you're taking climate change action and you get the marketing and whatever other benefit, you know, you get to take people out to look at it. Like, it would probably be individual for each funder. Um, but I know that in the central apps, it's much more as a, it's being much more pitched as a, you said you 
took this seriously, here's one way you can act. Um, it's a way that's carbon additional, so those offsets. It's not just being emitted somewhere else. It's a brand new thing that wouldn't happen without you. Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's, I think, more the argument. But I, I'll think more on, that's kind of an interesting parallel that I haven't thought about. I mean, I guess there's more than one way is to talk to the companies about it. But, um, I, <laughs> for now, it's I think is a, a much more positive, like, you know, you know this is a good thing, you want to get credit for doing it, we can work together on this sort of thing. Yeah, and I think, it, yeah, I appreciate the question, and uh, <clears throat> this is, you know, it's all complicated, as you know, from the, the working group, which is focused on the offset side, this is a little different, but um, in either case, I think it's not just feel good, it's about real additional carbon, yeah. um, whether it's happening through practices or through a commitment to be doing, uh, changing practices for a certain period or whatever. Um, sure. And so there is, uh, you know, again, some real, uh, carbon change that's a result of the uh, payment that's happening, uh, whether through an established offset market or through this fledgling idea that we're trying to uh, see if it works, basically. And I suppose it's one real life example. So yesterday, Microsoft pledged not only to go to carbon neutrality, but to remove the carbon that they had emitted over their business practices. That's a little different than an offset. So something like, I mean, I don't know whether they have plans yet for how they're going to get there. Or they just put the pledge out and they'll figure it out later. But something like this would actually be about removals of carbon from the atmosphere in a way that an offset wouldn't allow them to say that because it's about the carbon they're emitting over here being absorbed over here. So again, it's such a rapidly shifting it's one reason why I think the pilot did require a grant, because we need to have the money up front to sort of show, OK, we got this, we'll test it out. But those are the kinds of things that we'll be trying to think about as we as we move on in the pilot as potential funding sources. Thanks. Uh, so the forest carbon markets, are their value is on the, the increased carbon storage, right, between the current practice and uh, future storage sequestration, is that, is that right? Yes, so it's about that additional the carbon. Time. So it's that that's where the, yeah. the payment is for that additional carbon over time mm -hmm. and with a commitment uh, to sustain that carbon over the duration of the agreement. Well, but there are also there are also offsets on the forest conversion side. So there's avoided, oh, true. there's actually avoided, there's both, there's avoided loss, like this would have been converted from a forest and this carbon would have been emitted. And then and you're exactly right, Phil, that sort of, this is additional carbon that's sequestered because you paid for some action to be taken. And, and so in your uh, Massachusetts version, mm -hmm. in calculating your greenhouse gas reductions, do all of those count? Um, so in our Global Warming Solutions Act? Yes. So our baseline is that at 1990. So right. any forests that were there in 1990 are baseline. The, carb, the carbon that's there is baseline. The sequestration that happened in 1990 is baseline. And then things get a little more complicated because forests grow no matter what you do. So the baseline in that case is shifting. But the um, things that would Again, this is where we didn't integrate, this is where you guys should do a better job than we did of integrating this from the beginning. No disrespect to Han and David and others who are doing amazing stuff with it. But as we do this 80 by 50 study, we need to separate out what can be attributed to action that we took. That's additional. Like the state paid someone to do this thing and this carbon resulted. That's, that's not baseline, that's additional. That mm -hmm. is something that could count. What can't count is, good news, the forest grew. Like, we didn't do anything to create that. So that's still that's still baseline. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, it gets um, a little bit challenging when you're actually measuring it. But the good thing is, because we've measured forests for wood forever, we have really good data going back very far from the US Forest Service and lots of other sources. So it's possible to go back to a 1990 baseline, a 2005 baseline, or whatever you need, uh, and then look at what's happening now. And one more other question that I'll wait for the next round. Yeah. <laughs> um, are, uh, um, are things like biochar 
being explored yeah. as a story. That's so funny because so earlier today, um, I met with Jim Shallow in the Vermont office, and we have, as part of our Family Forest Carbon program pilot, on February 11th, we have our first stakeholder workshop about forest carbon practices. And so I've been working with some staff from the U.S. Forest Service and Jim and others to scour like all the lists anybody we know of has ever put together about this is what carbon positive forestry means. Um, and we're pulling that together into a hopefully much more understandable and shorter list that we'll put in front of stakeholders from Vermont and Massachusetts, so foresters and harvesters and state agency staff and academics and nonprofits, um, and try to get at which of these um, opportunity, which of these are opportunities in our region. I mean, some of them are just you know like mangroves, right? That's not even something we're putting on the list because it's right. pretty much not relevant. Um, and which, so which ones we think have potential here and which we don't, and sum up the evidence that we have for the carbon benefits, like where do the carbon benefits come from. So that is one of many policy uh, practices that is on that list for sort of let's really get our heads around the evidence um, about this and see whether or not this is something that we think is a potential here. And we're really leaning on the stakeholders to do that. We didn't want it to be you know, a TNC list. The idea is hopefully it is this broad swath of stakeholders with the help of TNC, US Forest Service, New England Forestry Foundation, state, you know, everybody, so that um, it comes out basically as solid and complete as we, as we can. So I don't have a lot of expertise in that area, but it's definitely one of many things, the list is quite long, that we'll be looking at and kind of looking to those stakeholders to help us ground truth and think through. Mike. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I was, I was you know, thinking about along the same lines, Vermont is 75% forest at plus or minus mm -hmm. 20%. And uh, <clears throat> so the idea of more reforestation is probably pretty impractical. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, any uh, additional carbon sequestration might do would be incremental. I'm wondering if, uh, if there are other other uh, ways of sequestering carbon uh, with other types of crops, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, that would produce carbon sequestration yet uh, take advantage of uh, farms and mm -hmm. other things like that. Yeah, I, that actually is a great uh, tie into uh, my next point on, on the list. So maybe I'll build off of that. On the forest side of things, I um, generally agree that you know we are largely forested, that our forests are generally well managed, um, and that, uh, but there are some opportunities for reforestation, particularly um, in riparian river, riverine areas, floodplains. The, historically, there were, uh, our floodplains were covered with floodplain forests, um, and much of that has been converted and for important reasons for agriculture in particular, among other things. But there are now, especially with the changing precipitation patterns that we're seeing and the increased frequency of larger floods, um, there are more ag low level, low laying ag lands that are becoming unproductive and there's an opportunity for working with farmers um, to take the land that's now marginal or really no longer viable for uh, sustained ag production um, and restore forests there for carbon benefits as well as water quality benefits, reduce flood vulnerability, habitat. It's this sort of whole suite of potential benefits. It's again, this is not like going to be the, the big lever that's going to solve all our problems, but it's another important uh, modest piece of the picture. On the ag side, um, what you're getting at, I think, is exactly in the wheelhouse of what Laura alluded to before, which is the um, what will be, I think, an ongoing effort of the what's called the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group that was authorized in Act 83 last spring. Um, it was sort of alongside the Forest Carbon Sequestration Working Group. So this is one that the Agency of Agriculture has been leading, uh, Deputy Secretary Eastman has been chairing, and looking at uh, ways to uh, <clears throat> 
potentially create a framework wherein agricultural producers, farmers, could be receive payments for enhanced environmental services that they're providing, um, with carbon potentially being one of those, along with water. Water quality was really the bigger driver of it, I think, but so water quality absorbing rain and snow melt, <coughs> uh, carbon enhancing productivity, and that group is really, they came out with a, an initial report just last week, and I encourage you to read it, and again, this might be a topic for further exploration uh, as you go forward, but um, their focus is around soil health, um, and that essentially healthy agricultural soils um, can <coughs> uh, absorb more carbon and provide those other benefits, including increased productivity. And it does mean or sort of tie into some changes in practices and crops and things like that. There are others who are much deeper, more deeply steeped than I am in the specifics of all of that, but that's sort of the concept. Um, so I, and it, I think it points to how the ag sector is a really important one to keep very much in mind, again, as like another bit of the silver buckshot uh, here. I'm not going to solve everything, but we can make some meaningful improvements for carbon as well as for all these other <coughs> important values. I just want to make one more point, then, and that's that I think the Nature Conservancy for your part in preserving the uh, Raven Ridge natural area in Charlotte, Pumpton, and Heinsburg. Thank you. Beautiful area. Thank you. Yeah, it's one that we're uh, really delighted to have been able to help in collaboration with the state and others to, to conserve permanently. And there's some terrific wetlands as part of that and other natural areas that are uh, forests that are absorbing carbon as well as providing really important habitat for native species and whatnot. So thank you. Should I keep going, move through things quickly on a few yeah, other points? I'm sorry, I thought you were done. No, no, yeah. I'm not. Okay. Uh, so a couple other things just in terms of current state policy dialogue and work going on. As some of you may or may not know, there's been a lot of dialogue led in the two ag committees around wetland policy and whether there ought to be any uh, adjustments made to that. I think the, the take home from our perspective on this from a carbon perspective, as Laura said, wetlands um, have a really outsized importance um, for carbon sequestration and storage relative to their size and abundance on the landscape. So it's really important for that reason, among a whole host of other ones, that we be doing everything that we can to maintain strong protections for our wetlands and for existing wetlands and to try to accelerate efforts to restore degraded wetlands um, <clears throat> for the carbon benefits that they offer as well as others. A uh, couple other things, uh, the state funding for conservation and restoration is critical for trying to optimize the opportunity that we have with natural climate solutions, forests, wetlands, ag lands. Uh, and those are the two big ones, I would say, are funding for VHCB and also water quality funding. Uh, and there's some um, important, significant levels of investment there, but there's never enough to do all the work that might be needed to really tackle those problems for their, uh, for a whole host of reasons. But carbon is an important layer to consider as we're thinking about the scale of those investments. Um, and then the other that I'd touch on is, um, as you all know, I'm sure, that lots of uh, effort underway to try to figure out how to modernize Act 250. And that relates, obviously, to our lands, uh, forest land, ag land, wetlands, river corridors, the whole nine. Yards. Important to think about those from a uh, carbon uh, side as well as other aspects of climate resilience, adaptation, and other things. I know that uh, your colleagues in the Natural Resources, Fish, and Wildlife Committee are actively thinking about that dimension. But I guess I, I wanted just to lay all of those different things out to convey. I, I, I think we think about them all as building blocks um, and or pieces of this. Uh, you know, the silver buckshot to kind of beat that analogy a little bit, um, but that provide opportunities and synergies with where you're trying to get to, uh, where, the, where the bill is trying to get to um, as that moves forward, and that they tie right in not only to the mitigating climate change, but also helping with resilience and adaptation. So you get to weave all of these together through natural systems. Um, let me just wrap up quickly with a few quick points on our take on the bill itself. Um, 
our position. For starters, I want to be clear that we strongly support uh, H-688. Uh, we see it as a really important foundational framework uh, for propelling the rapid progress and accountability that's needed uh, for Vermont to be doing our part in reigning in climate change. And it's an opportunity for Vermont, for Vermont to reclaim and reestablish leadership in this realm that we've been falling behind on um, in a broader than Vermont context. Um, so it's not going to solve all of our problems either. I think that was coming up in the testimony this morning with Deputy Secretary Walk uh, and the questions or points that were raised about the Transportation and Climate Initiative and trying to you know figure out a way to really rein in emissions from that sector. You know, we need to be coming at this from a whole bunch of different directions. But from our perspective, we see the Global Warming Solutions Act as one critical piece of that puzzle. Uh, we. I want to highlight and, and just appreciate the language that's in the bill right now that recognizes the role of natural systems for mitigation, so the natural climate solution side of things, and for resilience and adaptation. Um, thank you for to those who've been involved in, in drafting the bill uh, and sponsoring it for that. Uh, we support the provisions related to the alternative reduction mechanisms, uh, as they're called, and, and offsets uh, to achieve net zero emissions after 2050. So again, that ties right into what we've been talking about today. So glad to see that there's uh, some good language in there, and it's uh, beyond what uh, was built into the Massachusetts example. Um, we do have a few what I, I would characterize as just minor suggested revisions um, that I'd be happy to offer by Redline or to talk with Ledge Council or whatever might be easiest. It's around things like consistent reference where there's reference to lands to have it consistently referred to natural and working lands as opposed to just natural lands or just working lands or you know, some other combination of those um, and to incorporate uh, adaptation and resilience provisions at each step in the process. So in the, the development of the plan by the council and then by the agency as they're promulgate, promulgating regulations. Um, so it looked from our read, again, like that the adaptation and resilience provisions might not track through quite in all of those. So happy to talk about that. Um, and then one last one is just also uh, in the resilience and adaptation provisions, um, acknowledging the importance of uh, really are helping our natural systems to adapt and be more resilient to the change that's happening along with helping our human communities adapt and be resilient to the climate change that's coming. So if we're all in this together with the natural systems we depend on. And then I guess I'd just say, you know, we would welcome an opportunity when the time comes uh, to help out uh, with the council's work. Um, we have the potential with the Nature Conservancy to draw on our broader circle of colleagues outside of Vermont. Laura is one example of that, but there's a whole host of people that are working on these issues, mitigation, adaptation, resilience for nature and for people all across the country and the world. Happy to help pr bring that in to the extent it would be, be helpful um, for the committee and for the council and the state going forward. Um, I'll wind it down there. I, I want to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to testify. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we're really pleased that our incoming board chair, Wynn Smith, the uh, president of Sugarbush, uh, will be here on Friday uh, to testify. He'll be speaking really, I think, from the business perspective. Um, we've given you the TNC perspective, but he's, he's here in part with his TNC board member and incoming chair hat on. Uh, and so, and I have a couple of handouts, the one that I mentioned about the Family Forest Carbon Program, and then also just a, a little uh, infographic about forests as natural climate solutions that helps to just kind of quickly uh, capture what's a pretty complicated topic. So I can hand these around. And thank you again. Yeah, thank you. What, what I would ask you to do would be helpful, um, and we welcome, uh, you know, as granular as you want to get um, input on um, change to the bill that you would recommend. Great. Um, it would be helpful if you could um, pass that along to Danielle, just okay. so we have um, kind of a transcribed version of what your suggestions are. Happy to do that. I'll um, get okay. it to you by the end of the week. Would that be sure. next? Okay. Yep, that's great. Great. Um, a question I had that I wasn't quite clear on, Laura, that you had mentioned earlier <laughs> in terms of how the Massachusetts um, Global Warming Solutions policy works with regard to um, C-33 
sequestered carbon yeah. and how that does or would potentially contribute to the targets right. that are embedded in that, um, in that law. Um, mm -hmm. Right now it doesn't. So, yeah, so. so natural and working land, so let's use forest for an example because we're mostly forested. So in the 1990 baseline document, we have a line that says this is the amount of forest carbon sequestration in the year 1990. Yep. This is the amount of forest carbon stock in the year 1990. This is the amount of emissions from harvesting and development and any other thing that we can measure yep. in the year 1990. And then those numbers show up in the Global Warming Solutions Act document. But then there, I'm trying to be careful in how I say this because there's been a lot of action, even though they haven't been in there, but they're, they're gone then. So like in the, what are our emissions and where are we? You don't see that. Yep. So it's a little bit, that's kind of what I was trying to get at is like, we put them in the baseline, which is really important, but then we sort of didn't put them throughout the rest of the bill in as integrated a way as I think we could. They're always off to the side as an asterisk. Yep. So right now, and again, we couldn't count the baseline, but if we took action to cluster development and and convert fewer forests, that also is not included in, um, well, that one is because it's reduced emissions from conversion, but there are things that we probably could count, they'll be very small, like we've said, that aren't, I think, fully incorporated. And it's one of the things that I, I don't envy the job of my uh, colleagues in the state agencies who are working on the 80 by 50 study because they decided in that to really try to wrap everything together and it's proving difficult to do when you didn't do it from the beginning. Wrap everything together in terms of how lands okay, lands and the sequestration piece may fit. Right. That. So in the scope of the study, lands are now a sector. Mm -hmm. So there's a chapter on buildings, there's also a chapter on lands and that's a shift from the way we did our original plan and documents. Okay. And just, I mean, as, as this isn't a question, but just as a sidelight, um, uh, I was very interested to understand how New York approached this yes. and the work yeah. that they had done. And yep. there seemed to be some flips and twists that they were doing to try and incorporate this. Yes. Um, Maine might be a better example. That was exactly <laughs> my impression. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Maine's doing, a, I think, a really great Maine's probably more analogous to Vermont anyway, oh, and they're being very careful and I think very forward thinking about how they're looking at, you know, we have, we have a lot of forests, we have not a lot of people. Like, how do we do this so that we're being honest, we're not cheating, we're not just saying, oh yeah, the forest, it's fine, we can admit whatever we want, but they're also really trying to, like, look at the opportunity in their forest and land sector and say, but we have room to grow here. Mm -hmm. We can do these things and then we'll count them in the following ways. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Scott and then um, Well, I was just going to say that we didn't, uh, or uh, the bill doesn't doesn't uh, name drawdown specifically as, mm -hmm. as, as, as a goal. So we have, we have resilience, we have adaptation, and of course greenhouse gas emissions reduction. But we haven't we haven't named drawdown as mm -hmm. a you know sort of um, uh, by name, and, mm -hmm. and so I guess I'm wondering whether you think that would be a valuable thing to do. Um, I mean, I am not an expert on this bill. I read it uh, to try to, and it, and I'm not actually a policy person, so I read it as well as I could to prep for this. It looks really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the elements you ha you need are there. Mm -hmm. I think my message is more, it's all about the implementation. You know, when you get past that and you mm -hmm. have the bill and it's the Climate Council, that's where I think some of the lessons from Maine, from Massachusetts could really help you. Um, so again, I didn't, as a quick sort of layperson read of it, it from this topic, it seemed like the bill's language is, is every everything you need. Yeah, we get. I, I appreciate you raising raising this. Um, I think my my sense of reading it so far is similar to Laura's that it's in there, and you know the, the idea of um, mitigation, you know, mm -hmm. um, as well as resilience and adaptation um, can get at the drawdown concept. I think depending upon how it's interpreted and applied. Uh, but let me take a, a look back at it again and 
Uh, I guess I'm always just wondering what, what, whether, um, I don't know, clarity or, or, or specificity would be would be a good thing. Yeah, I think just building on what Laura said from the Massachusetts experience, this notion of, of uh, treating the land sector as, as a, a sector, sector yes, from sure. the get-go, um, and I'm not sure that that needs to be spelled out in the bill, but that that should be part of um, the way that the council right. is right. understanding its charge um, right. would be helpful, and that that's thinking about both the the um, emissions source aspect of the land sector as well as the emissions, the drawdown right. side of. The I guess I'm just wondering whether whether by naming drawdown, that's 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 telling the council. That it has to uh, account for for lands, and it has to and it has to account for opportunities to, to increase the sequestration and storage in in ag and and, uh, and forestry. Just a question in my mind. That's all. Yeah, I think it's a good one to be thinking about. Um, I'm just curious whether uh, you talk about land-based solutions or is water Massachusetts Bay figure into Oh, I anywhere. took out all the ocean slides, <laughs> all of them, because you guys don't I mean, have it's ocean. It's not relevant to us. But yeah, I'm curious. That's that's funny. I, I actually pulled them as like, well, <laughs> you know, maybe I won't show this coastal. So blue carbon is actually a huge thing for Massachusetts because we have this little strip of coastal wetlands, both on the land and then eelgrass beds in the you know near shore in the water, and those blue we call them blue carbon systems just because it's you know. Salt marshes, eelgrasses, and mangroves globally are referred to as blue carbon systems. And that's a really fascinating system because they, the plants sequester carbon each year, and then it goes into sediment that's underwater, so there's no oxygen. So it is there indefinitely. It's anaerobic. It doesn't really decay and emit, and it accretes over time. So under a blue carbon system, you could have 100 years worth of sequestered carbon. And you can imagine then when we don't get our sewage systems quite right and we dump a bunch of nutrients into those systems in a way that kills them or we, you know, worse, we sort of expose, we um, dewater them. There's a word for that. We expose them to air. All of that carbon can come roaring back. So in Massachusetts, that's actually a, a big, it's kind of like city trees. Maybe not relevant here. <laughs> Definitely something that's relevant there and something that our Division of Ecological Restoration has developed, like a blue carbon calculator, and there's all sorts of references to it in our Global Warming Solutions Act. Ten years ago when we passed the bill, I think we didn't um, quite have the science that we needed to on this, so there are a lot of like placeholders, like we're gonna figure this piece out better, um, and now I think we, we're getting better at being able to do that. What are the carbon, specifically, what are the carbon benefits of restoring these systems, what are the carbon benefits of avoided degradation and what levels of nutrients do you need to get below to reach that. So there's, um, I have two colleagues who are up to speed on this and I kind of just feed off of what they do, but yeah, so I, I took it out because I didn't want to bore you guys with stuff they'd be like, we don't have oceans, <laughs> but yes, it's definitely relevant there. And, and I might just add that although we don't have the marine blue carbon, we do have the, uh, we do have the well, we do have the lake. and, and basically freshwater uh, yeah. wetlands, um, mm -hmm. and as we were talking about before, just of the importance of those. And yeah. they, too, are places where you get that long stored carbon in a largely uh, unoxygenated setting. So if there isn't the decomposition and emissions going on, it just is accumulating in some of our wetlands, not all of them. Uh, but so where there's that uh, great storage, um, and there's the risk of significant emissions if the wetlands are converted, essentially. So it's, you know, it, it's a, the other part, it's our part of the, the bigger picture of wetland-related uh, systems and their role in all of this. Absolutely. Does our lovely uh, milfoil absorb many, or is that completely useless? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good question. I mean, all plants absorb car. They, they are carbon, right? Yeah, they're pulling it out, and that's how they are creating their uh, their fiber and their uh, you know uh, their structure. Um, so we're to plant no foil. So <laughs> that said, that said I, you know, please don't interpret <laughs> please don't interpret this as an endorsement of milfoil. I don't want that on the record. Uh, uh, no. So I think you know that there are obviously major problems with that and other invasive 
plants, um, both aquatic and terrestrial, uh, and although they are forms of carbon, as we are too, uh, they're big uh, ecological and uh, human-related problems that those uh, non-native species create. I would say as a very general rule, there's less biomass in a monoculture or a system dominated by one species, salt marshes maybe being the exception, <laughs> than a diverse system. So my hunch, not knowing much about milfoil, would be that it's similar to a lot of invasive plants where you're actually going to have a less favorable carbon balance in a system that's invaded by that than the native species that have you know divided all the niches and are adapted to being there. But um, I don't know much about that particular example. Thank you guys. For, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not no, I just maybe would have more <coughs> mention one other thing I've talked to Phil about this before. Um, that Fortunately, a good chunk of Vermont's land is privately owned. Mm -hmm. So again, when we say we or our land, we have to understand that there is a, a private sector ownership mm -hmm. to this. So a lot of these programs, whether you know, there was some discussion in the uh, sequestration group about um, well, you know, maybe we could extend the cutting periods from a 10-year cycle to a 20-year cycle. Um, if that's the case, again, we have to consider uh, property owners that have to pay property taxes, mm -hmm. and something yep. that hasn't been mentioned is property taxes, and that's uh, kind of a leading cause of, <laughs> of course, fragmentation or sell-off or yeah. cutting. I mean, you know, uh, so I think that's that's an important aspect as well to mention as far right. as uh, property taxes alone have a have a critical role to play in in what happens to Vermont's privately owned forests. And I think it's very analogous in Central and Western Mass, where nearly, I mean, we have some state land, but it's mostly in very small, I mean, even smaller parcels than you guys have private ownership. And so any of these programs that are about um, supporting landowners as they do good silviculture, but maybe helping them with things that will have carbon benefits or protect soil or whatever, are really designed around how do you incentivize those landowners to do it, or at least reduce the cost. There's an analog to farming in Massachusetts where the state is looking at buying cover cropping equipment because small farmers can't afford the equipment to do the practice. They might they might actually be able to afford if they're selling some of the cover crop or it's increasing their yield, the practice itself, but not the equipment. So there, I think there are a lot of examples of that, of sort of recognizing it has to make sense for the, the landowner who similarly is struggling with really high rates of, rate, really high values of the land for development and really low values of the land as, as forest. So getting that balance right is, um, is relevant for us as well. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, yeah, I think you know, that private lands are the predominance of the land ownership pattern uh, in Vermont, um, forest land and, and otherwise, and I think it's critical to try to figure out how to make this work essentially in a way that's helping to support private landowners and what I think the vast majority of them want to do, which is to continue to own and steward their lands uh, and help to figure out with incentives um, or with revenues that can be coming in from different sources, whether that's offset markets or whether it's some of the payment for practices kind of ideas that the Family Forest Carbon uh, Program is trying to get at. Um, and, you know, these are... Uh, you know, our landowners are scattered all around the state, but many of them are in uh, our rural parts of the state that are struggling economically, the, the vulnerability issues um, of individual landowners and, and of communities that are so critical. Uh, so if we, get this, if we get this right, there will be an opportunity to use this as one part of a broader package of solutions that can be helping to deal with some of those really persistent pressing critical challenges, um, along with efforts to deal with the resilience uh, and reducing vulnerability, those sorts of things. Again, the role that our natural systems can play in helping to achieve that. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you thank so you much for much. your time really in a hot, stuffy this. room. Yeah. 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 This is really We're doing our own anaerobic. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> That's right. And, and I guess I'll also just say thank you for the work that you're doing on this. Um, realize like this is a lot of long uh, days of hearing from a lot of people um, in a small stuffy room, but the work that you're doing is really important and wherever this leads to, uh, anyway, I just want to thank you on our behalf for leaning in and for everything else that you do here on behalf of Vermont. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.